Welcome to this compilation of four intense and dramatic science fiction short stories that have stood the test of time. I'll be narrating Virgin Ground by Rosal George Brown, Doorstep by Keith Laumer, Messenger by William Morrison, and Prison of a Billion Years by C.H. Thames. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Virgin Ground by Rosal George Brown Narrated by William Skye Annie signed on a bride ship for Mars. There were forty brides, and when she got there, thirty-nine men were waiting. The pilot shoved open the airlock and kicked the stairs down. OK, girls, carry your suitcases and I'll give each of you an oxygen mask as you go out. The air's been breathable for fifteen years, but it's still thin to newcomers. If you feel dizzy, take a whiff of oxygen. The forty women just stood there and looked at each other. Nobody wanted to be first. Annie moved forward, a bulky suitcase practically floating in her hand. She was a big woman with that wholesome expression which some women have to substitute for sex appeal. She'd made a great senior leader at summer camps. I'll go first, she said, grinning confidence into the others. I'm not likely to bring out the beast in them. She waved herself out, letting the grin set and gel. It was odd to feel light. She'd felt too heavy as far back as she could remember. Not fat heavy, bone heavy. The sweat on her face dried suddenly. She could feel it like something being peeled off her skin. Arid climate. It was cold, but she had the warmth to meet it. There they were. Forty men. There were supposed to be forty. What if one of them had died? Who would go back? Not me, Annie prayed to herself. Dear God, not me. She tried to count them, but they moved around so. They were looking at something, not Annie. The girl coming down the ramp behind Annie. It was Sally, with the blonde hair on her shoulders. That's all they'd be able to see from there, the blonde hair. But a man was coming forward. He had a tam-like hat, pulled low to good-humoured eyes and an easy stride. Wait, Ben, one of the other men said. See the others. I pulled first, didn't I? Yeah, but you ain't seen but two yet. I want that blonde one. Let Gary see the others. And he led Sally away. He didn't feel her muscles, or look at her teeth, or measure her pelvic span. After Sally came Nora. Nora giggled and waved, making a shape under the shapeless clothes. Wasn't that just like Nora? Okay, so she was cute. Second man took Nora. He didn't wait for the others. Third man took Regina. Regina looked scared, but you could see those big cow eyes a mile off. Regina obviously needed somebody to protect her. The other girls came out. Annie counted, and her heart hit bottom. Someone was going to be left over. Four women, three men. They all felt embarrassed. It was the kind of thing the colonists would talk about for years. Who was last? Who was second to last? Spiteful people would remember, and in a tight little community, spite took root and throve on the least misinterpreted expression or... But then this wouldn't be a tight little community, Annie remembered. The lichen farms were spread out over the whole temperate belt of the world, because the lichens were grown only on hills, where the sand would not cover them, and because they did a more efficient job of oxygenating the atmosphere when they were spread over a wide area. One man, hat in hand even in the cold. A little shriveled man with a spike of dust-coloured hair, but kind-looking. Ah, he drawled in embarrassment. He clicked his tongue. You're both probably too good for somebody like me. I don't know. Both fine women. The two women stood in silence. What's your name? Annie. Mary. Mary? My sister's named Mary. Fine woman. He took Mary's hand. No disrespect to you, Annie. They were all gone. I could take you on my Venus run, the pilot said. He too was embarrassed. But I'm afraid I'll have a full ship after that. Unless you can buy the weight and space. I'd be glad to take you free, but the company... Annie's eyes were full, but she wasn't going to let them spill. Sally brought Ben by, already looking self-consciously married. I'm sorry, honey, she said. Look, Annie, if you want to come stay with us until another shipment of pioneers come to break ground, you're welcome. Maybe you'd uh, find one of them you liked. 
It was a gesture of kindness, of course, but it made Annie's eyes spill. She turned her head away toward the red hills, red and the cultivated ones green, Christmas colours. Sure, Ben said, swell. Any friend of Sally's is a friend of mine. And the way they looked at each other made Annie's heart lurch. Thanks, kids, she said, but I don't believe I'll try it. And don't worry, this isn't the first time I've been stood up. Are you coming? the pilot shouted across the field. Hate to rush you, but I've got a schedule to meet. Was she coming? What else could she do? What happened to him, Ben? Annie asked. My... the other man that should have been here. Ben worried a hole in the sand with one foot and cleared his throat. He stayed home. You mean he's alive? Here? Well, yes, but he didn't... Never mind. I don't need anybody to strum a guitar under my window. If he couldn't get away from the farm today, I can certainly go to him. I've got a pair of legs that'll walk around the world. You coming? the pilot shouted. No, and he cried. I live here. The spaceship took off, a phoenix rising from the flames. Ben was shuffling his feet, hands in his pockets. We'd be proud to have you stay with us, Annie. Oh, cut it out, Ben. I'm no hothouse rose. Just tell me which way and I'll find my own farm. She paused, trying to guess his thoughts. You think he might be disappointed when he sees me? Is that it, Ben? I know I'm no pin-up girl, but I'm a worker and a breeder. He'll see it. In the end, that's what's going to count. Ben was still making holes in the sand with his feet, trying to say something. Please don't worry, Annie went on. Your friend won't be sorry. If he doesn't want to marry me right away, okay, I can understand it. But I can give him a chance to watch me work. That isn't it. Ben said finally. I think you look fine, Annie. It's... it's any woman. He told them not to send a wife for him. Any woman. But that's ridiculous. He knows the laws. Five years and then a wife. Why did he stake out in the first place? That was before, Ben answered. Before what? Oh, it's not for me to say. Why don't you just forget Bradman? He's a good enough guy, but not for you. You come... Which way and how far? Ben looked at her hard. Okay, on Mars, your life is your own, he pointed. Second farm bubble you come to, and you better hurry. It ought to take eight hours and night falls like a ton of bricks here. Annie made it in seven. Easy. She went up to the transparent hemisphere. He was inside working. She shouted, but if he heard her, he didn't look up. She went to the flap that must be the door. There wasn't anything to knock on, so she opened the flap and walked in. There was nothing in the room but a cot, kitchen equipment, and lichen growing on a number of tables. The air was richer than outside, and Annie breathed it thirstily. I'm Annie Strug, she said, smiling and wishing it wasn't such an ugly name. He glanced up, angry blue eyes under a growth of black hair. He didn't say a word. Annie set her suitcase down and looked out at the green growth on the hills. Look, Mr. Bradman, she cried suddenly, pointing a spatulate finger to the western horizon. What in the name of heaven is that? There was a catch of fright in her voice. We don't say Mr. on Mars, he said reluctantly. Brady. But you don't have to call me anything because you're leaving soon. He was a big, arid man with a sandy voice. But his hands, as he stripped the lumpy brown fruits from a giant lichen, were surprisingly delicate. What is it? Annie asked again, turning instinctively to the big man for a reassurance and protection she had no reason to expect. Bradman straightened and moved away from her, looking at the black giant growing up from the earth in the distance, and moving straight toward them. It's a sandstorm, he said. It'll be here in ten minutes. Annie let out the breath she had been holding. Oh, that doesn't sound so bad. I don't know what I thought it was. I was just frightened. She smiled shyly and apologetically at Bradman. Bradman grimaced at her, his agate eyes frozen in a pallid face that should have gone with red hair. The sand-blown lines in his face were cruel. Sister, you've got a smile like a slab of concrete. Don't try it again. You didn't have to say that, Annie said quietly, closing her eyes against the winds of her anger. You didn't have to come here, he replied. Goodbye. I'm not leaving, she said, still holding tight the doors of her anger. I am. He paced heavily over the sand floor and pulled back the flap of the door. 
Where are you going? Annie glanced back at the towering giant, now glowing red in the sunlight, like some huge, grotesque devil. Into the storm cellar. Nobody lives through a Martian sandstorm. Annie ran after him. For God's sake, take me with you. You can't leave me. Mine's built for one, he said, and pulled the top in over him as he disappeared into the hole. Annie broke her fingernails, pulling at the cover. The wind was blowing sand in her eyes. She saw blood staining the rim of her index finger. She pounded with her fists. Let me in, she screamed. In the name of God! But all she heard was the keening sand in the wind. She looked around. The devil was closer, malignant and hungry. He'd wanted to eat her alive. It made her angry. I'll fight it, she screamed. By God, I'll fight! Five minutes, she guessed. Maybe five minutes left. She ran into the house, ripped open her suitcase. Bundles of nylon marriage clothes. She began to sob. Some were with lace. Fight, she shouted to herself. There was her oxygen mask. How much oxygen? Anybody's guess. It was made for maybe a few whiffs a day over a period of several months. Swell. But it wouldn't keep the sand from tearing through her eyeballs and flaying her alive. Wrap in nylon nightgowns? Ridiculous. Spacesuit? Annie went through the one-room house as fast as she could. No spacesuit. Why should he have one? Three minutes left. Sand was blowing under the hemisphere, piling up at one end and oozing out beneath. It was possible she would simply be buried. The refrigerator! That wasn't a refrigerator, only a cabinet, loosely joined. Annie went outside, on the side where the field of lichens grew up a smooth stone hill. The red devil was whistling at her now, a low, insinuating whistle. Something rattled faintly against one steel rib of the hemisphere. It was a shrub, about five feet tall. Annie began to laugh hysterically. Brady had protected the shrub with loving care. It was tied to the steel rib through grommeted holes in the hemisphere, and covered with its own plastic bag to shield off the wind. One minute. The red devil was shouting now, laughing with triumph. He ran his sandy fingers through her hair and blew his gritty breath in her eyes. She pulled the zipper at the bottom of the polyethylene bag that covered the shrub and yanked the bag off. It was heavy, almost oily plastic, slippery and pliant. There was no time to decide whether it would be better inside or outside the house. She pulled the bag over her head, inside out, so the zipper would close completely. Then she folded the zipper part under once and wedged herself as far as she could go into the space between shrub and hemisphere, holding the oxygen mask in her teeth. With infinite care, though she was not likely to split the heavy bag, she pulled off her shoes and her heavy woolen walking socks. She put the shoes back on. Her slacks covered her legs. Only her ankles were bare. She unraveled one sock and stuffed the yarn in her ears. There was a sudden, remarkable quiet. Then, even through the yarn came the roar of the storm. For it was upon her. She looked through the milky plastic into a wild red inferno, spitting at her in furious frustration. Then she bound the other sock over her eyes. She was in a blind, muffled world now, buffeted against the shrub and the wires and the steel rib, but not painfully because of her heavy clothing. It was as though suddenly all her senses had been switched to the last pitch before silence. I might live, Annie thought. I might. There was sand in the bag now. Annie could feel it sifting under her collar and blowing up her ankles. Not much. It was coming from the bottom of the bag. Probably the end of the zipper had worked open just a little. Was that the dull roar of the storm through her stoppered ears or the rushing of her own blood? If sand were seeping in, the storm must still be on. How did Bradman breathe in his storm cellar? Would the storm last long enough for the air to go bad? It would go bad fast in an enclosed space on Mars. Bradman. What sort of monster would walk off and let another human being die? Without a glance backwards. Did the cold desert wear the humanity out of a man? How did a human being get like that? You've got a smile like a concrete slab. Is that what you say to a person when you know you're about to leave them to die? Unmarried women between the ages of twenty-one and thirty. Good health. Well-adjusted. Marriage on arrival. Mars transport leaves October 1st. Good health. Well adjusted. She could see the printed words, red stereo words reaching out from the page. Unmarried women between. They came and went in her mind and there was a roar in her ears. The words were gone now. Only a redness that came and went. No, a blackness. 
Annie snatched the exhausted oxygen mask off her face and gulped a pallid, sandy breath of air. It wouldn't do. She took the sock off her eyes and bound it around her nose and mouth. It would filter some of the sand out. She opened her eyes briefly and closed them. The grit stayed in. She didn't dare open them again. But the storm looked weaker. Or was it her imagination? She groped for the zipper. Foul air would kill her quicker than sand. She couldn't find it. Hell with the zipper! She pulled her little mending kit out of her pocket and slashed the bag with the scissors. The storm sounded louder now, with the bag gone. The sand blew under her eyelids, ripped her face, tore a burning circle around each ankle. Annie put her face in her hands, breathing through her nose and the sock. She held herself stiffly. She didn't want to cough. The whole world was a blind, gritty pain. There was no end to think of, only pain. A greyness. A blackness. Finally, a voice. Bradman. You ruined my shrub. Did you have to slash the bag too? Annie opened her eyes. They felt red and ruined. They were watering so much her cheeks were wet, she could hardly see. She was having a coughing fit. She dragged herself upright. All she could see was sand. The plastic bubble had blown off the girders, and if the furnishings in her suitcase were there, her eyes were still too dim to see them. Do you know what that shrub's worth on Mars? Annie found the yarn had fallen out of one ear and she pulled it out of the other. Do you know what that bag's worth? Gall ran in her veins. She spat it out of her mouth. She backed up to the steel beam and braced her feet against it, light in the Martian gravity. I told them not to send a woman out here. She pushed off and sank her fist into his teeth. He went down. She was too light, but he was too light too. It evened out. She turned his face and held it in the sand. Her strength was insane. Do you know what a human life is worth? She screamed. He struggled, but she fought his bucking body, kept his face buried in the sand until he was dead, and a long time after. An age passed. Annie was frozen in a world rhymed over with white starlight, sequined with frost. Then the cross-eyed moons came up. She found an edge of the plastic bubble, rumpled and limp and half buried in the sand. She pushed off the heaviest hills of sand with her hands and pulled it out. She climbed up the anchored girders with it and then slept the rest of the night in her own home. The next day she dug out her household supplies from the sand. The day after, she cleared the sand from the lichens on her farm. On the fourth day, she called a few neighbours in, and late in the evening she buried Bradman. No one questioned her. It had been, after all, self-defence. She kept the farm as well as any man. Better. She worked. How she worked. She kept herself numb with labour, her mind drunk with the liquors of fatigue. After five years, he came. He just appeared inside the door flap, looking a little nervous, but grinning. I'm Jack Hamstrong, he said, his voice full and wholesome, like Iowa corn. I, you weren't at the spaceport, so I figured, what the heck? I just walked. This is my farm, Annie said. My hands are on every inch of it. Hamstrong's ruddy face turned in on itself a little. I know, I know the story. I didn't come to take anything away. I came to... Good Lord, didn't you know you'd be sent a husband? Annie's eyes went queer like a cat's. A husband? If they told her, she hadn't heard. Go away, she said. She looked around at her farm, the fruits of her travail. Alone. The virgin birth. No, he said firmly. It's yours and mine, legally. I'm not a mean man, Annie. You'll find me patient. But stubborn. I can wait. Annie sighed. Or was it a shudder? She looked up again at the puckering edges of the evening sky. She put down the knife she had been peeling a giant lichen with. She wiped her hands on her apron and lifted the door flap. All right, then, she said. Wait. For what? The sandstorm, she said, and she got into the storm cellar and pulled down the weighty lid, locking it behind her. Doorstep by Keith Laumer Narrated by William Skye The general was bucking for his other star, and this miserable contraption bucked right back. Steadying his elbow on the kitchen table serving as desk, Brigadier General Strout levelled his binoculars and stared out through the second-floor window of the farmhouse at the bulky object lying canted at the edge of the woodlot. 
He watched the figures moving over and around the grey mass, then flipped the lever on the field telephone at his elbow. How are you boys doing, Major? General, since that box this morning... I know all about the box, Bill. So does Washington by now. What have you got that's new? Sir, I haven't got anything to report yet. I have four crews on it, and she still looks impervious as hell. Still getting the sounds from inside? Intermittently, General. I'm giving you one more hour, Major. I want that thing cracked. The General dropped the phone back on its cradle and peeled the cellophane from a cigar absently. He had moved fast, he reflected, after the state police notified him at 9.41 last night. He had his men on the spot, the area evacuated of civilians, and a preliminary report on its way to Washington by midnight. At 2.36 they had discovered the four-inch cube lying on the ground fifteen feet from the huge object. Missile, capsule, bomb, whatever it was. But now, several hours later, nothing new. The field phone jangled. Strout grabbed it up. General, we've discovered a thin spot up on the top side. All we can tell so far is that the wall thickness falls off there. All right, keep after it, Bill. This was more like it. If Brigadier General Strout could have this thing wrapped up by the time Washington awoke to the fact that it was something big, well, he'd been waiting a long time for that second star. This was his chance, and he would damn well make the most of it. He looked across the field at the thing. It was half in and half out of the woods, flat-sided, round-ended, featureless. Maybe he should go over and give it a closer look personally. He might spot something the others were missing. It might blow them all to kingdom come any second, but what the hell, he had earned his star on sheer guts in Normandy. He still had him. He keyed the phone. I'm coming down, Bill, he told the Major. On impulse, he strapped a pistol belt on. Not much use against a house-sized bomb, but the heft of it felt good. The thing looked bigger than ever as the jeep approached it, bumping across the muck of the freshly ploughed field. From here he could see a faint line running around, just below the juncture of side and top. Major Greer hadn't mentioned that. The line was quite obvious. In fact, it was more of a crack. With a sound like a baseball smacking the catcher's glove, the crack opened. The upper half tilted, men sliding. Then, impossibly, it stood open, vibrating like the roof of a house suddenly lifted. The driver gunned the jeep. There were cries and a ragged shrilling that set Strout's teeth on edge. The men were running back now, two of them dragging a third. Major Greer emerged from behind the object, looked about, ran toward General Strout, shouting, A man dead! It snapped! We weren't expecting it! Strout jumped out beside the men who had stopped now and were looking back. The underside of the gaping lid was an iridescent black. The shrill noise sounded thinly across the field. Greer arrived, panting. What happened? Strout snapped. I was checking over that thin spot, General. The first thing I knew it was coming up under me. I fell. Tate was at the other side. He held on and it snapped in loose, against a tree. His skull... What the devil was that racket? That's the sound we were getting from inside before, General. There's something in there, alive. All right, pull yourself together, Major. We're not unprepared. Bring your half-tracks into position. The tanks will be here soon. Strout glanced at the men standing about. He would show them what leadership meant. You men keep back, he said. He puffed his cigar calmly as he walked toward the looming object. The noise stopped suddenly. That was a relief. There was a faint and curious odour in the air, something like chlorine, or seaweed, or iodine. There were no marks in the ground surrounding the thing. It had apparently dropped straight into its present position. It was heavy, too. The soft soil was displaced in a mound a foot high all along the side. Behind him, Strout heard a yell. He whirled. The men were pointing. The jeep started up, churned toward him, wheels spinning. He looked up. Over the edge of the grey wall, six feet above his head, a great reddish limb, like the claw of a crab, moved, groping. Strout yanked the point forty five from its holster, jacked the action and fired. Soft matter spattered and the claw jerked back. The screeching started up again angrily, then was drowned in the engine roar as the jeep slid to a stop. Strout stooped grabbed up a leaf to which a quivering lump adhered, jumped into the vehicle as it leaped forward, then a shock, and they were going into a spin, and... Lucky it was soft ground, somebody said. And somebody else asked, What about the driver? Silence. Strout opened his eyes. What? 
about... A stranger was looking down at him, an ordinary-looking fellow of about thirty-five. Easy now, General Strout. We've had a bad spill. Everything is all right. I'm Professor Lieberman from the university. The driver, Strout said with an effort. He was killed when the jeep went over. Went over? The creature lashed out with a member resembling a scorpion stinger. It struck the jeep and flipped it. You were thrown clear. The driver jumped and the jeep roared on him. Strout pushed himself up. Where's Greer? I'm right here, sir. Major Greer stepped up, stood attentively. Those tanks here yet? No, sir. I had a call from General Margrave. There's some sort of hold-up. Something about not destroying scientific material. I did get the mortars over from the base. Strout got to his feet. The stranger took his arm. You ought to lie down, General. Who the hell is going to make me? Greer, get those mortars in place. Space between your tracks. The telephone rang. Strout seized it. General Strout! General Margrave here, Strout. I'm glad you're back on your feet. There'll be some scientists from the State University coming over. Cooperate with them. You're going to have to hold things together, at least until I can get another man in there to... Another man? General Margrave, I'm not incapacitated. The situation is under complete control. It is, is it? I understand you've still got another casualty. What's happened to your defensive capabilities? That was an accident, sir. The jeep... We'll review that matter at a later date. What I'm calling about is more important right now. The code men have made some headway on that box of yours. It's putting out a sort of transmission. What kind, sir? Half the message, it's only twenty seconds long, repeated, is in English. It's a fragment of a recording from a daytime radio program. One of the network men here identified it. The rest is gibberish. They're still working over it. What? Bryant tells me he thinks there may be some sort of correspondence between the two parts of the message. I wouldn't know myself. In my opinion, it's a threat of some sort. I agree, General. An ultimatum. Right. Keep your men back at a safe distance from now on. I want no more casualties. Strout cursed his luck as he hung up the phone. Margrave was ready to relieve him after he had exercised every precaution. He had to do something fast before this opportunity for promotion slipped out of his hands. He looked at Major Greer. I'm neutralizing this thing once and for all. There'll be no more men killed. Lieberman stood up. General, I must protest any attack against this Strout world. I'm handling this, Professor. I don't know who let you in here or why, but I'll make the decisions. I'm stopping this man-killer before it comes out of its nest. Maybe gets into that village beyond the woods. There are 4,000 civilians there. It's my job to protect them. He jerked his head at Greer, strode out of the room. Lieberman followed, pleading. The creature has shown no signs of aggressiveness, General Strout. With two men dead? You should have kept them back. Oh, it was my fault, was it? Strout stared at Lieberman with cold fury. This civilian pushed his way in here, then had the infernal gall to accuse him, Brigadier General Strout, of causing the death of his own men. If he had the fellow in uniform for five minutes. You're not well, General, that fall. Keep out of my way, Professor, Strout said. He turned and went on down the stairs. The present foul-up could ruin his career, and now this egghead interference. With Greer at his side, Strout moved out to the edge of the field. All right, Major, open up with your fifty calibers. Greer called a command and a staccato rattle started up. The smell of cordite and the blue haze of gun smoke. This was more like it. He was in command here. Lieberman came up to Strout. General, I appeal to you in the name of science. Hold off a little longer, at least until we learn what the message is about. Get back from the firing line, Professor! Strout turned his back on the civilian, raised the glasses to observe the effect of the recoilless rifle. There was a tremendous smack of displaced air and a thunderous boom as the explosive shell struck. Strout saw the grey shape jump, the raised lid waver. Dust rose from about it. There was no other effect. Keep firing, Greer! Strout snapped, almost with a feeling of triumph. The thing was impervious to artillery. Now who was going to say it was no threat? How about the mortars, sir? Greer said. We can drop a few rounds right inside it. All right, try that before the lid drops. And what we'll try next, I don't know, he thought. The mortar fired with a muffled thud. Strout watched tensely. Five seconds later, the object erupted in a gout of pale pink debris. The lid rocked, pinkish fluid running down its opalescent surface. A second burst, and a third. A great fragment of the menacing claw hung from the branch of a tree a hundred feet from the ship. 
Strout grabbed up the phone. Cease fire! Lieberman stared in horror at the carnage. The telephone rang. Strout picked it up. General Strout, he said. His voice was firm. He had put an end to the threat. Strout, we've broken the message, General Margrave said excitedly. It's the damnedest thing I ever... Strout wanted to interrupt, announce his victory, but Margrave was droning on. Strange sort of reasoning, but there was a certain analogy. In any event, I am assured the translation is accurate. Here's how it reads in English. Strout listened. Then he carefully placed the receiver back on the hook. Lieberman stared at him. What did it say? Strout cleared his throat. He turned and looked at Lieberman for a long moment before answering. It said, Please take good care of my little girl. If you're enjoying the stories, please activate the like button for this video. It helps me create more content like this. Messenger by William Morrison Also known as Joseph Samaxon Narrated by William Skye He had to find a single planet somewhere in the vast universe. The trouble was, if he found it, would he remember what he must do? He knew that there had been trouble, and he had been told what he had to do. The trouble was, he had forgotten. He didn't remember where it was. He had been speeding past an off-colour white dwarf when it happened. If he had taken the trouble to look around, he would have seen that the white star was going to explode. He knew a potential nova when he took a good look at one. But after all these centuries he had grown careless, and when the blast had come, the small star suddenly blazing into a billion-fold brilliance, the penetrating radiation had hit him with full intensity. There had been no ship to protect him, no clothing that might serve as a shield. His kind had done away with such things eons before, as they had learned to move through space by using some of the radiant energy that filled it. He had blacked out completely. When he came to again, he was far past the Nova, in the dazzling brightness of a rarefied cloud of radiant hydrogen atoms. The Nova itself had lost so much of its momentary brilliance that it was now indistinguishable from the myriads of other stars. He himself was speeding on with feverish haste towards a nebula cluster a thousand light-years away. He slowed down. He had the feeling that the distant cluster was not his proper destination. But what was? What star, what planet was the spot in space he had to find? And what was he supposed to do once he got there? And who had given him the instructions? Where in the vast immensity of the universe was the place called home, the place where he could return for the information he had forgotten? He didn't recall. He knew only, with that same distressing vagueness, that somewhere there was something he had been ordered to do and that once given, the order had to be carried out. He travelled aimlessly, by feeling alone. Time meant nothing to him as an individual, for his kind had long mastered the problems of age. But time meant much to those he had been sent to. To do what? Was it to help? They must be waiting for him now. They must be wondering why he didn't come. He would have to hurry. Hurry to do something he didn't yet suspect, but would sooner or later remember. After a few centuries he began, in his anxiety, to talk to himself, as is the way of individuals too long alone. That star cluster there could be it, he said to himself hopefully, and veered toward the right. Doesn't look familiar though, he muttered. Maybe if I would get closer. He came close enough to see the thousands of stars as individuals, to pick out the satellites circling the bright disks of light, to study the pale planets themselves and their tiny sub-satellites. As he turned his attention from one to another, disappointment slowly filled him. No, this was not the place. There was nothing in the configuration of the stars, nothing in the size or position of the planets that sounded a familiar chord in his consciousness. He would have to go further, or turn back. He left the place behind him. The next time the same thing happened, he didn't have quite so much hope, and his disappointment was less keen. But it was disappointment nonetheless. Time was passing, and they must be waiting for him impatiently. After a while, 
The hope and the disappointment both died away, almost completely. The former shrank to a tiny spark that grew dimmer and dimmer as the centuries passed. He wondered if it would ever wink out entirely. It was characteristic of him that the anxiety this caused was only for those who were waiting, expecting him hourly, and wondering why he didn't come. He had no sense of fear for himself, no feeling of despairing loneliness that might be expected to arise from being so long isolated in space. It was only that he would have liked someone to talk to besides himself. On a fair number of planets he found animal-like creatures in different stages of development, and on a few he discovered life that was intelligent. It was with these that he had a renewed feeling of anticipation, the spark of hope glowing momentarily before it faded again. It's intelligent life I've got to find, he told himself. But where? His astronomical memory, insofar as it covered the post-Nova period, was perfect, and he paid more attention to the details of star and planet configuration than he had ever done before. Gradually, a star map formed in his mind, a map that covered enormous distances of space. Those places he had investigated and eliminated from consideration were slowly crossed off. It was a large needle he had to find, and his own powers were considerable, but the haystack he had to search was infinite. There was no telling how many more centuries would pass before he found it. And then another thought struck him. They'd know back home that something had gone wrong. Would they send someone else to do the job in his place? He rather doubted it. He had a vague feeling that there weren't many with his own peculiar talents. What had to be done had to be done by him or left undone altogether. More time passed, and one day, when the space charted on his brain map had grown to vast dimensions and the spark of hope had become so tiny that he was not quite sure any longer that it was there at all, he noted from a distance a galaxy that seemed familiar. That's it, he cried. That's it! The spark flared, and as he sped toward the galaxy it became a flame. It was a lens-shaped assemblage of stars, with two small spiral arms composed of a few million stars each, and it was seemingly not too different from millions of other galaxies he had passed in the course of all those centuries. But to him, seeking so desperately, this galaxy was unique. It was the right one. He coursed through it from spiral arm to spiral arm, and now there could be no doubt. The star he wanted was small and yellowish, far from the centre of the lens. It had a rather elaborate planetary system, which he recognised at once. This was it. The third planet, the one with a single sub-satellite, was the one he had been sent to find. To find and perhaps to help. But how? The finding of the planet had solved one problem. So far it had given him not a hint toward the solution of the second, the reason why he had been sent here. There was life on this ball of mud and water, a great deal of life, both vegetable and animal. And some of the latter could, without too great a distortion of the truth, be called intelligent. It had raised cities, tunnelled into mountains, changed the appearance of sections of the planet itself. It was to this intelligent life that he had been sent. A dim memory of the need for caution kept him from letting himself be seen. I'd only frighten them, he thought. I'll have to investigate thoroughly before I reveal myself. And maybe the investigation will remind me of what I have to do. The first thing was to come down to Earth. Choosing the dark side of the planet, shaded from the central sun by its own bulk, he shrank his body and let himself drop in the gravitational field. From time to time he slowed his fall in order to keep from flaming through the atmosphere and attracting their attention. And at a thousand feet above the surface he came to a complete stop, hovering over a city and making up his mind where to land. Something droned toward him through the air, coloured lights winking on and off. He darted downward and to one side, Where the city lights faded out, he let himself fall all the way to the ground. He was off a dimly lit highway. Small metal vehicles ran along it, their lights momentarily tearing apart the darkness ahead of them. A glance through the metal at the creatures inside the vehicles gave him a queer thrill. Yes, these were the ones he had been sent to. Quickly reshaping his body and clothing himself so that he seemed to be one of them, he began to walk along the highway. Cars sped past him, picking him out in their headlights. None of them stopped, but he had time to probe their minds and listen to their language. What he found was not pleasant. Among all the feelings which controlled their thoughts, fear was easiest to detect. 
and along with the fear were hatred and envy and greed, anxiety and guilt. Oddly enough, there were also hope and affection for each other, but it was the worst feelings that predominated. There was no doubt that they needed help. That didn't make any clearer, however, what he had to do. He had an idea that it was not his mission to work out a detailed solution. He had to do some simple thing, something... The two men were lying in wait, either for him or for some other pedestrian they judged sufficiently unwary. He sensed them long before the first one stepped out toward him, a cigarette in one hand and what was supposed to be an ingratiating look on the brutal face. Got a match, bud? The other man suddenly plunged at him from one side, an arm wrapping itself around his neck. The assailant tried to bend him back, the forearm cutting across his windpipe. The arm of the first man swung, a rough fist smashing at his face. Then the two assailants screamed in pain and terror, where they had touched him. Fist and arm broke into flame. Both men turned from him in horror and ran off wildly, as if to get away from themselves. He hadn't meant to hurt them, but they had contrived their own punishment. Perhaps... no, that wasn't it. He wasn't here to punish, either. He walked along, and soon he found himself entering the city. A man in a blue uniform watched him suspiciously and ordered him gruffly to get moving. "'I am moving,' he said pleasantly. "'Don't you get wise with me?' said the blue coat, and raised a threatening club. He paid no attention to the club and kept on toward the heart of the city. What he saw only confirmed the impression he had obtained from the minds of the men and women in the cars. Too many thoughts were mean and ignoble, arising only from selfish and vicious desires. Many of those who saw him seemed to sense his strangeness and moved toward him with a single impulse, to take advantage of his ignorance. Men spoke to him out of the sides of their mouths, offering him bargains. Women offered themselves. Look, Mac, this stuff is hot, see? Just came off a truck. Want to look at some nice pictures, mister? I can give you a good address, bud. Out for a good time, Jack. The planet was sick. Had he been sent to cure it? He came to an area of broad lighted streets. Lights glittered everywhere, attracting the attention of those around him by going on and off. Great posters advertised the attractions inside places of amusement. He entered one of them, an astonished ticket collector calling after him. Hey, where's your ticket, bud? But there was something about him that prevented the man from pursuing. He lost himself in the darkness and watched the screen. Here, in brief and vivid form, was pictured the life of the planet. Women in bathing suits plunged into a pool and formed a pattern which imitated sensuously the petals of an unfolding rose. A small animal leaped through hoops and climbed a ladder. Groups of men drove against each other for possession of an object which they kicked occasionally into the air. An elderly man looked grim and made a speech into a microphone. And then a film showed the main business of the planet – which seemed to be the killing of its supposedly intelligent inhabitants. Bombs exploded, planes crashed, desperate lines of men ran forward to meet their deaths. Something quickened in his mind. He almost remembered now. This was what he had come here about. His will moved and the theatre vanished behind him. Now he was on the battlefield itself. The reality was worse than the image, far worse. Here were not only the roars of the great guns, but the curses and screams of the wounded, the gasps of the dying. Here were not only horrible sights and sounds, but the odours of death, the sharp nitrogenous fragrance of explosives, the heavy sulphurous smoke of burning oil, the sickening smell of sweating or decaying flesh. A cloud came into being from the explosion of a mortar shell, and two men dropped to the ground. In answer to the mortar, the flaring barrel of a tank gun spoke hoarsely, and half the crew of the mortar fell in turn, but there seemed no end to this deadly dialogue. The next moment there came the burst of a bomb from a low-flying plane, and the tank half turned over on its side, a heap of smoking steel. He knew at last why he had been sent here. He knew now what he had to do. He ripped the flaring-mouthed gun from the tank. His hands twisted the thick metal into a shape it had never known before, bent it into a strange curve, fashioned it so that it would emit overtones to chill the souls of those who heard it. His brain charged the instrument with the energy of his own mind, energy that would send its voice to the far corners of this diseased planet, 
and leave not a single individual deaf to its dreaded tones. Putting the improvised horn to his lips, Gabriel blew the call for which the planet had so long been waiting. Prison of a Billion Years by C. H. Thames Narrated by William Skye Adam Slade was a man who had nothing to lose by making a break for it. The trouble was, he knew that no one had ever escaped from there. Adam Slade crushed the guard's skull with a two-foot length of iron pipe. No one ever knew where Slade got the iron pipe, but it did not seem so important. The guard was dead. That was important. And Slade was on the loose, with a hostage. That was even more important. The hostage's name was Marcia Lawrence. She was twenty-two years old and pretty, and scared half out of her wits. She was, before she came a hostage, a reporter for Interplanetary Video. She had been granted the final pre-execution video with Adam Slade, and she had looked forward to it a long time, but it had not worked out as planned. It had not worked out as planned because Slade, only hours from the execution chamber, with absolutely nothing to lose, had splattered the guard's brains around the inside of his cell and marched outside with a frightened Marcia Lawrence. Outside the cell block, while other condemned prisoners roared and shouted and banged tin cups on bars and metal walls and Judas Hole grills. Outside the prison compound and across the dome-enclosed city which served the prison. Then, outside the dome. Outside the dome there was rock. Rock only, twisted and convoluted and thrusting and gigantic like monoliths of a race of giants. Rock alone under the awesome grey sky. Steaming rock for some of the terrestrial waters was still trapped at great depths, and the sea far off, booming against rocky headlands, hissing tidily and slowly, in an age-long process, pulverising the rock. The sea far off, a clean sea, not sea-smelling sea, a sea whose waters must evaporate countless times and be borne up over the naked rocks in vapour and clouds and come down in pelting, endless rain and rush across the rock, frothing and steaming, a sea which must do this countless times in the eons to come, and would do it to bring salinity to its own waters. It kind of scares the hell out of you, doesn't it? Adam Slade said. He was a big man with a thick neck and heavy, sleepy-looking eyes and a blue beard shadow on his stubborn jaw. He said those words as he climbed out of the prison tank with Marcia Lawrence. The tank's metal was still warm from overheated travel. I didn't think anything would scare you, Marcia Lawrence said. She had conquered her initial terror in the five hours of clanking tank flight from the prison. They had come a great many miles from the prison dome, paralleling the edge of the saltless sea, and then finally, when their fuel was almost gone, clanking and rattling down toward the sea. She was a newspaper woman, that above all now. She must not be afraid. She had a story here. A story. Get moving, Adam Slade said. I've got nothing against you, lady, he told her for the tenth time. But you try anything, you're dead. You get that? I got nothing to lose. One time is all they can kill me. But first they gotta find me. But they won't be able to take me as long as you're here. Just stay meek and you'll stay alive. How long do you think you can hold out? Marcia Lawrence asked practically. They had begun to walk away from the now useless tank. Adam Slade was carrying the dead guard's M-gun in the crook of his bent left arm and walking with long, easy, ground-consuming strides. Marcia almost had to run to keep up with them as they went down a stretch of slightly sloping black rock toward the steaming, hissing, pounding, roaring, exploding surf. Slade smiled. Plenty of water, he said. But no food, Mr. Slade. There is absolutely no food on Earth now, and no possible way of getting food unless you want to stick around for a few million years. You think I came out here without a plan? Slade asked with some hostility. I don't know. You were desperate. As long as you're with me, I figure they might follow. But they won't rush me. They might even send over a copter. But it won't try anything. Not with you here. Desperate? I'm not desperate, and don't you forget it. Desperate you don't think straight. Once is all they can execute me. I stayed behind, they'd have done it. If they catch me, they'll do it. What's the difference? You said you had a plan? They reached the edge of a thrusting headland, an enormous beak-shaped cliff of beetling black rock which leaned out over the young, still saltless ocean. Slade paced back and forth quickly, with a powerful leonine grace, until he found a fault in the rock. The fault tumbled jaggedly, 
steeply down almost to the edge of the sea. Down there, Slade said. We'll follow the seacoast back to the prison. Back? Marcia said in disbelief. Hell yes, back. You said it yourself. There's no food out here. Since there ain't no life, of course there's no food. Oh, it's a great place for a prison, all right. Whoever thought of it ought to win a prize. A prison a billion years in the past. What's the word? Archaeozoic, she supplied. Yeah, Archaeozoic. An Archaeozoic prison. You can escape to your heart's content, but what the hell's the difference? There's no life back here, not yet. The Earth's just a baby, so you escape and you starve to death. It makes every maximum security jail before this one look like a kid's piggy bank. There hasn't ever been an escape, Marcia said hopefully as they made their way down to the sea, she in front and Slade behind her with the M-gun. There ain't never been a hostage before. No. There's a hostage now. Marcia Lawrence took a deep breath and asked suddenly, Are you going to kill me? Hell, I don't know. I got no reason to unless you make me. We're going back there. We're double-tracking along the beach, get me? Back to the prison dome. But Adam Slave won't starve to death out here. We'll double back to the dome and the time machine. Oh, she said. They began to walk along the edge of the sea, its waters sullen grey, mirroring the sky. Here on this dawn earth, the sky has as yet never been blue, for the primordial waters were still falling. It rained almost all the time, and the air was thick with moisture, and every night when the sun, as yet unseen by the dawn earth except as an invisible source of light, went down and darkness came, the mists rolled in from the sea. In the morning, whether rains had fallen or not, the ground was soaked and tiny freshets rushed down to the sea, returning to it. Look out! he cried suddenly and shoved her against the base of the cliff which overlooked the water. The cliff top thrust out over them, umbrella-wise. The base of the cliff was thus a concavity, and they pressed themselves against it now, in shadow. The waters of the infant sea were a hundred yards away, surging and booming against the rock. She heard it soon after he did. A helicopter. She wanted to scream. She wondered if they would hear the scream. But she looked at Adam Slade's face and did nothing. Soon the helicopter came, buzzing low over them, searching. It circled a great many times because the abandoned tank was there. It circled and came down on the beach and two uniformed figures got out. Now she really wanted to scream. One sound. One sound and they would hear her. One quick filling of the lungs and... Adam Slade hit her suddenly and savagely and the black loomed up at her, but she did not remember striking it. When she awoke, the helicopter was gone. Sorry I had to poke you one. Slade said. He did not seem sorry at all. He said it automatically, and then added, You ready to walk? She nodded. She got up and staggered a few steps before her legs steadied under her. Then, with Slade, she walked down along the rocky beach. This, she thought, was a story. It was the only big story she had ever had, and probably she would not live to write it. As a woman, she was almost hysterical with fear, but as a videocaster, she was angry. The story was hers if she lived to tell it. Then she had to live. Time prison. Sure, she thought. Utterly escape-proof, unless someone like Slade could take a hostage, double back to the prison dome, the hermetically sealed dome, and somehow trick or overpower the guards who watched the time-travelling machine outside the prison dome. Outside. Naturally, it would be outside. That way the prisoners couldn't get at it. Unless, like Slade, they too were outside. Outside where life had not yet been born. Outside the infant earth. Let a man escape. What did his escape matter? He would live exactly as long as it took a man, reasonably healthy, to starve to death. Unless he had a hostage and a plan. She became aware of rain when they left the cliff overhang. There was almost no wind and the rain came down slowly at first, huge slow drops which splattered on the black rock. If it gets any harder, Slade said, we'll have to duck under the cliff for protection. You don't know what a rain can be like back here. I seen them through the dome. But they couldn't go under the cliff for protection, not if they wanted to keep going. For the cliff dropped suddenly in a wild jumble of rocks, and then there was nothing but the sloping black beach sloping down to the sea. Then, all at once, someone opened the sluice gates and the rain bombarded them. It slapped and bounced off the rock like pistol shots. It struck them like hammers. They staggered under its weight. We'll have to go back to the cliffs, Marcia cried. 
She yelled it again at the top of her voice because she realised Slade would not hear her otherwise as the rain cracked and exploded and splattered and crashed. There were no droplets of water, for each one had size and shape and weight, swift falling, hammering weight as it came down. Each one, Marcia thought wildly, struggling to keep her feet, was the size of your clenched fist there in the grey dawn of earth. The cliffs! she cried again. But Adam Slade shook his head, grabbed her arm above the wrist and pulled her after him. He pointed ahead in the direction they had been going. He said nothing. There was no need to talk. They were going forward, and if it killed them, probably Adam Slade didn't care much. He wanted that prison time machine for his escape, and he was either going to get it, or die in the attempt. They went on slowly. First one would fall, and then the other, and when it was Slade who had fallen, she would wait patiently, hopefully. If he ever released his hold on the M-gun... But if it were Marcia who fell, Slade would yank her to her feet savagely, yelling words which she had heard at first, but which after a while, after an eternity of the storm, seemed to merge with the sound of the rain and the far booming of thunder out over the water, and then, as if by magic, she was walking again and stumbling along with Slade, drenched and beaten and half-drowned. She hardly remembered when night came, but presently she was aware of the darkness and the mist over the sea and over the rock and now engulfing them with its white ectoplasmic tendrils. In the mist she knew she could escape Slade, and yet she did not. Without Slade now, now in the middle of nowhere, there by the sea on the shores of the young earth, she would die in the storm. With Slade, at least for now, was life. And she went on. The thunder followed them, and came closer. By the middle of the night it sounded like artillery at a distance of half a mile, like a barrage of big atomic shells just out of sight behind a black ridgeline which wasn't there. And through the deeper rain-wet darkness of early morning, through the mist, tearing the mist to tatters, shredding it, came the spears and forks and lances of lightning. It was, Marcia thought, a nightmare of a storm. And she must remember it, for it would make a story, a real story, if she ever lived to tell it. By morning... The air smelled of ozone. It reeked of ozone, and around them as the grey light seeped out of the wet sky and the rain suddenly slackened as if the weak daylight dispelled it, the black rocks were blasted and broken where lightning had struck. In the dawn's first light, another helicopter came. Get down! Slade shouted, and they dropped among the blasted black rocks, hiding there, not moving. The helicopter came on through the slackening rain, buzzing a few hundred feet over them, but not circling. It was heading for the abandoned tank, Marcia thought. It wasn't looking for them here. But suddenly the rain came down in all its savage force again, blinding, bounding off the rocks, pounding relentlessly. Overhead the helicopter seemed to pause like a bird stricken in flight. The rotors whirled a silver shield against the rain, the great drops splattering off the shield. And the helicopter came down under the weight of the rain. It landed a hundred and fifty yards from them down the beach, and Marcia watched breathlessly while three men got out and looked at each other and at the rain. The dawn light was still only a dim grey, and Marcia could not see the men clearly, but abruptly a jagged spear of lightning blasted rock midway between where they were hiding and the helicopter, and in the afterglare through the wet and almost crackling air, the men were very clear. And clearer still when other lightning came down around them, ringing them in, it seemed, like a tent. There was now so much lightning, it looked more like an aurora than an electric storm. The dawn earth, before life, spending itself in fury. All at once, Marcia was running down toward the edge of the water, where the helicopter was. She ran screaming and shouting, but the thunder swallowed her puny voice. At every moment she expected Adam Slade to kill her, to merely stand up with the M-gun and shoot her, but he did not, and perhaps her unconscious mind in the instant she had fled had instinctively known he would not. For if Adam Slade killed her, he had no hostage. If he killed her, and they found him, he would have absolutely no chance. She turned and looked behind her. There was Slade, silhouetted against the lightning, running, covering the ground in huge strides, gaining on her. She did not look back again. The whole world was lightning and thunder, and her legs striking earth under her, up and down, up and down, pounding, running, fleeing, and the rain, Slade's ally, beating her, buffeting her, exploding against her. She stumbled and fell, but she was up and running again in a moment. Now Slade was very close. But the helicopter was close too. She did not think the men there had seen them yet. She waved her arms and screamed, although she knew the screams would not be heard. And then Slade was on her. They went down together, and she knew she was frail and helpless before his great strength. He grabbed her, his hands, angry hands, on her throat. 
and lightning struck. It bounded and bounced off rock a dozen feet from them. It shook the earth and blasted the rock in pieces like shrapnel cluttered all around them and struck them too, and Marcia felt hot blood on her arm and it was her own blood. But Slade had been momentarily stunned, and she was running again, away from him. But away from the helicopter too. At first, she did not realise that, but when she did realise it, it was too late. If she doubled back now, she would rush into Slade's arms. She ran, into the sea. It was suddenly, unexpectedly calm. It merely eddied around her ankles, as if waiting for something. The storm seemed to be waiting too, lightning holding back, the thunder stilled even the rain hanging there in the black heavy sky, waiting. Slade came after her, stalking through the surf. A single bolt of lightning lanced down at them, and a great engulfing roar lifted Marcia, carried her, stunned her, and then the rain pelted down again and the sea was an angry sea, and the air was supercharged with ozone and another smell, like seared flesh. She saw Adam Slade then. Slade was down in a foot of water, face down, He was not moving, and the water lapped around him, over him. She went to him, walking slowly. The men from the helicopter were there too. They had seen in that final flash of lightning. "'Are you all right, miss?' one of them shouted. "'Yes. Slade?' They turned him over. They looked at him. "'Dead,' one of them said. "'Dead,' she echoed. She would have collapsed, but they caught her. Then the rain really came down, not as it had come before, which was hard enough. It came in huge globes of water, and each globe was as big as your head, and if it hit, it could stun you. Slade? Someone cried as the globes exploded violently in the surf around them. He's dead. He'll keep. And they went back to the helicopter with Marcia, to await the end of the storm there. When it was over, when the sky was not black, but merely the colour of lead, they returned down the beach for Slade's body. But Slade wasn't there. But he was dead, Marcia said incredulously. One of the men smiled. He didn't go any place under his own power. He was dead all right. The storm took his body out to sea is all. They stood there for a moment, gazing out across the black troubled water of the infant ocean on the infant earth. A billion years ago. Slade was out there. Slade. Dead. Out there with the tides and the waters and the frequent electric storms. Out there with a million bacteriological parasites on his dead body and in his dead body, which he brought with him, Marcia said dreamily. What are you talking about, miss? Out there in the electric dawn of earth, with the bacteria which lived in his body as they lived in all other bodies. Out there with them, dead. Food for them. Food and water and air heavy with ozone and the electric storms. Marcia laughed hysterically. It was a story she wanted to write, but she wouldn't write it. Slade was a killer condemned to die, but Slade, dead out there with his bacteria, Slade, evil to man and human society, but not necessarily evil in the implacable ways of nature, or perhaps grimly, terribly evil, Slade out there, dead on the bosom of the primordial waters, Slade back in time a billion years before life had been born on earth. She laughed hysterically as they led her away from the water. They slapped her face, gently at first, then harder. I'll be all right she managed to say. She would be all right. She could live to forget it. But Slade out there? Slade. Slade fathering all life on earth there in the sea with his dead body. Slade who had sinned and was taken back here to die for his sins so that life could be born. Slade, whose first name was Adam. Thanks for watching and listening to this video. For more science fiction and fantasy stories like these, make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out the videos appearing on screen now.